Five not working for me. Do you view the... Oh, oh yes, yeah, it did work, thanks. Um, my presentation is going to be very specific about um, the case of um, developer-led um, retail gentrification. And I'll be drawing in particular, it's going to be a very concrete sort of, um, uh, or based on the work I've been doing at Elephant and Castle and in Seven Sisters with the Latin American sort of business cluster, but also with a lot of other sort of migrant ethnic um, businesses in the area. Um, I'm also drawing from my experience um, with Latin Elephant, which is a charity. Um, even though now people recognize Elephant and Castle a bit as Latin Elephant, it really is the name of the charity that I founded, um, and that it's sort of um, also I'm sort of now the chair of the trustees. Um, and um, it's sort of based a lot on the, on the sort of research that I did. So I sort of fluctuate between being an academic and having come out of, out of academia, done this, and back into academia. And I'm sort of using that experience to reflect a lot on, on, on that work, and that's what I'm going to do that um, today. But I'm also going to sort of answer the question that I was set, which is how is gentrification impacting contemporary uh, sort of London? So I want to start with this um, um, sort of um, quote in particular, um, developer-led gentrification is the antithesis of spatial justice. And this form of gentrification is supported by local governments who justify dealing with the housing crisis by long leasing public um, land to corporate capital and facilitated by local and regional planning offices policies. It is also sustained by social enterprises who are complicit in the process by landing in local areas with no knowledge of the communities that are negatively impacted by the proposed developments. Policies and programs of investment to supposedly ameliorate or mitigate negative impact on regeneration on local groups act as a public relations veneer that hides the root causes of economic, social, and racial inequalities in our cities. So what is the problem with Develop, uh, with developer-led retail gentrification. And here I'm going very quickly through this because we only had 10 to 15 minutes to do. So I'm only giving a glimpse of, of, of what the, the, the issues are. You can ask me questions later on on details. But to start with, consultation is flawed. The community is very much asked to participate um, uh, 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 and instead of sort of listening to their ideas and their visions for that area, they're asked to choose between pre-made models or alternatives. So really it's not a consultation that is based on, on what their vision is. There's also a fear of discourse, uh, a, a fear of change discourse amongst developers. Um, phrases like, the community is afraid of change. Local groups do not want change. It wants the same old, same old. I've heard that over and over again from developers and from local councillors as well. So whilst local groups insist, and this is something that I keep sort of saying a lot as well, um, it is not development or change that we oppose to. It is this particular form of development that we oppose because it is not policy compliant and because it does not benefit local communities and long-standing populations. And that was the case in, in particular of the Elephant and Castle Town Centre planning application, um, that it wasn't policy compliant to start with. They also use a lot of divide and rule tactics. And here we have to consider the role of councillors in the process, the developer employee that wants to discredit all those who oppose the development, a lack of transparency in decision-making process, intimidation of key players, whether that be traders, organizations, students, staff, individuals, and even academic institutions, which we have partnered with. And so in this picture, the social enterprise emerges as well. And some of these social enterprises, not all of them, are aiding processes of gentrification by fulfilling um, the local government and the developer's agenda. This is another business venture that supports values driven by capital and profit rather than social value and fostering the community's um, relations in, in that sense. But that it really is up to us, to the local groups and um, working with, with it, it, on the ground. 
Um, it is up to us to highlight and make visible the socioeconomic value that residents and traders alike bring to the area that is being gentrified. The cumulative impact of um, Is it the arrows? Space. Okay, perfect. Um, and, and, and these slides just mention, uh, just have some, some pictures of, of what we've been doing with, with the lives of the people behind the, the, the Elephant and Castle area. And this was a project we did um, um, on, on a proposal that we had about um, converting the area into what was a, a Latin quarter, which came from a vision of workshops we did with traders. Um, and this was a sort of um, photography um, uh, project that we had just to sort of highlight what they did. But the cumulative impact of, of, these, um, of these processes on local groups is staggering. The number of local campaigns emerging and the, uh, that are active at the moment in London is testament to the set to this sentiment of enough is enough. Um, um, local groups are feeling a form of regeneration that is leading to gentrification, to displacement, to fragmentations of London's most vulnerable um, communities. Developer-led gentrification is decimating these communities. These, these pictures demonstrate which, what is that we're going to be losing. It is forcing out families who can no longer afford to live in London. This form of gentrification is about segregating communities. It is also about a form of spatial consumerism. It is about the city as an object of consumption, and it is not about new forms of citizenship or community building, and certainly not about spatial justice. This form of gentrification is met with resistance um, from local groups and campaigns. Even though the picture I'm putting is rather um, um, sort of bleak, what I want to now sort of um, highlight is that the community resurfaced stronger out of this process. So I want to give you some examples about how resistance happens on the ground. And in particular, I'm going to talk a little bit about Latin Americans who have felt these two big business clusters in Elephant and Castle and Seven Sister are very much at risk of being displaced. Um, and they have left their, their mark in London's urban fabric, and they have demonstrated that they are a resilient community fighting for its place in London along, alongside other economically and disadvantaged and minority um, uh, ethnic groups in London. Um, the battles in Seven Sisters have gone over 10 years, and the same in, in Elephant and Castle. So this, the, the, there have been really loads of gains, loads of losses, ups and downs. So it's a really resilient community that has organized and demonstrated its capacity to renew, to renovate, and to re reinvent itself under conditions of due risk, due risk and risk of eviction for very key um, places that they once helped revitalize. On a cold winter's evening on the 18th of January 2018, the Up the Elephant campaign, and these are some of the groups that are part of that campaign, took to the streets of um, Elephant and Castle and marched down towards Southern Council offices where members of the planning committee were to decide on Elephant and Castle's future or the town centre application. Traders, community activists, housing campaigners from across London, students and supporting staff from the London College of Communication joined up, up efforts to demand a halt on the application. On that evening, so, while some of us offered evidence to support the opposition to the planning application, protesters took to the streets with banners displaying messages of, we love the elephant, home for peoples, not for profit, protect our barrios, and stop the displacement of migrant and ethnic traders. Whilst the procedure unfolded within the council offices, protesters joined the symbolic salsa dance lesson and the anti-gentrification bingo game. These were some of the requirements of the campaigns. This was a multifaceted um, sort of and concerted campaign that was amplified through social media. All those groups were simultaneously tweeting putting it in all sorts of social media platforms, and we had that one message, right? And, and that helped a lot. Um, on that evening, and after seven hours of deliberation, two o'clock in the morning it was, that went way into the um, early hours of the morning, um, the application 
was rejected. The rejection and the deferral of the planning application at this meeting was the biggest achievement of the campaign. So even though we're fighting quite big developers, sometimes we do achieve quite a lot. But we have to fight every single step. And the community groups end up saturated as well because it's years and years of fighting for one percentage more of whatever it is that we want, right? So everything is met with resistance. Um, and the cultural markets are markers of Elephant and Castle here, I want to make this point, which is home to sort of London's largest Latin American business cluster and a bingo hall and a bowling alley that sort of catered to disadvantaged sort of older and young BME groups in the area were very much taken to the streets of Southwark to claim for a development that brought benefits to the diverse population of Elephant and Castle. This, to me, was a clear example of how cultural practices not only shape a neighborhood's identity, but are very much used as a tool to resist gentrification. This campaign is a clear example of how equality matters were taken out into the streets in a symbolic performance that, transform, that translated into a statement of equality, fairness, and anti-gentrification. The chart displayed now shows the gains that have been obtained by the campaign over the two-year period since its submission of the application in December 2016 to its final approval on January 2019. It didn't even have what was the policy that was to um, have a 10% affordable place, um, a affordable space for traders. Um, but these are, you know, sort of uh, ne throughout the year, right? One by one, meetings, lobbying, all sorts of issues. And it was many groups, many people, each, um, um, doing their bit and, and, and drawing on their, on their knowledge and assets to gain a little bit more. So this process, um, even, uh, the, the application was probably, uh, was finally approved in January 2019, but there are still some other legal battles going on. And this process is obviously taking its toll on traders um, who are experiencing low morale and high levels of anxiety due to lack of transparency in the, in the relocation process and in the future, really. So recent research by Latin Elephant um, showed that approximately 40 traders are being left out. There simply isn't enough space to relocate them all. And as we have consistently argued, you know, even when the application was um, approved, where are these traders going? There isn't enough space on the short term, on the long term. It's not even just about money. It's just that there isn't enough space around. Um, so division amongst traders is also common. It is caused as well by dirty and sort of unethical practices by developers. It's done by intimidation, by victimization, and targeting of more outspoken traders. And this has happened more in Seven Sister than, than, than we know of um, the case in, in, in Elephant and Castle. But it has happened. Latin Elephant has been victimized and sort of intimidated at, at, at various, and if not us, our partners. Um, this is met with resistance, campaigning, saturation, and a resurgence of local groups. Every little gain that local groups and campaigns achieve require a great deal of determination and conviction to face lengthy and costly legal processes. It draws groups together as much as it creates internal divisions and at times costly for furthering fostering community relations. It is frustrating process and at times local traders and groups end up exhausted by the process but also re-energize re as these struggles over place gain wider public support. For example, crown forging campaigns to cover legal costs are a clear example of the larger appeal and sense of determination from the London population that cares about social and spatial justice. So ultimately, what Latin Elephant is doing is advocating for spatial justice and equality by scrutinizing policies that have a negative impact on London's most vulnerable populations and by challenging with evidence, which is one of our strengths, what has become a skewed process. And it is not easy for developers of the council um, to have to give in because the evidence that we present is compelling. So no wonder we've been sidelined by developers and the councils in this process. But we stand by our approach and our commitment to the groups we work with. And that is one thing that will never change. Developer-led gentrification is creating segregated urban spaces by privatizing ordinarily public spaces. It is displacing, fragmenting, decimating, and strip mining communities across London. 
developer led gentrification magnifies in very concrete ways via practices and physical structures, economic, social, and racial inequality in our cities. And I hope that after this very brief and sort of fast <laughs> sort of journey, I've convinced you that developer-led gentrification, supported by local governments and sympathetic social enterprises, is the antithesis of spatial justice and will be met with resistance by local groups and ongoing campaigns striving for social and spatial equality. Now leave it here. I guess of an iconic case in London and uh, Antoine's is a very different presentation and I think looking at sort of much more um, everyday um, way in which uh, gentrification is uh, changing and happening across London so it's a, a, a Okay, so uh, as Alan said, yes, I'm going to give, a, let's say, a bit, bit more of a macro uh, perspective. Um, what I want to do is discuss three analysis of UK census data um, that I've completed over the years, um, first by myself, then with Alan, and more recently with uh, brought in uh, Pauline Nisson from the uh, GLA. Um, every time it's been trying to expand on this analysis to try and do more and more, add in more, more variables. So uh, the thing is this data is becoming a bit old now. It's 2001 to 2011. That's the latest uh, census years we have. So I may not be giving today uh, a description of contemporary London, but I, I don't think that many of these trends have stopped in the last years. And it would be interesting once we get the, the, more, uh, the next census data to be able to see whether this is, this is the case or not. So apologies, it's not the most contemporary analysis of London you'll hear, but um, I think some of the trends are, are, have no reason to, to have been interrupted. So my, the work in general um, is trying to stay, take stock of the return of the private rented sector uh, in the UK, which has doubled since, since 2002, and to try to understand what impact this may have had on, on gentrification. There's been some discussion of the different tenure shifts accompanying um, gentrification, but the literature in general has sort of stayed on this imaginary that gentrification at, on the residential side uh, is one of sweat equity where uh, the middle classes enter an area, buy from uh, more deprived owners' houses that they then invest in, and then sell at a huge margin. And this ownership gentrification is the sort of the prevalent story that has been linked to gentrification uh, for a long time. But I think the, the return of the private rented sector um, has introduced another type of gentrification, which I've sort of... Um, tried to explore along with, along with my co-authors in the last couple of years. So some reasons why the private rented sector has come back, and I think there are many more, but I'm just listing some of the big ones, is the deregulation, first of all, of this sector in 1988, uh, which has made it the sort of insecure, um, very temporary uh, sector that it is today. Then in this work, I, I pay a lot of attention to the idea of buy-to-let, uh, not only to point out that it is a, a sort of a financial instrument, uh, but also that it is uh, a more broader pr process of tenure shift where homes that used to be uh, in ownership are then, or social rents, are pushed to the private rented sector. Um, and this, this has been linked to the, in the literature to the importance of asset-based welfare with austerity and, uh, and re retrenchment of the welfare state. People are uh, looking to their retirement or taking care of their retirement by investing in property uh, to have an asset that they can then draw on uh, in later life. And this has created a distinction between those who are able to accumulate properties, have multiple properties, uh, and those who are increasingly stuck in the private rental sector, uh, mostly younger cohorts, uh, and we've seen that younger cohorts at the same age as their, um, uh, as previous generations are, uh, have much less um, home ownership levels, have much lower home ownership levels. 
And this can be linked to the whole discussion on wealth inequality and PKT and so on, that we're witnessing actually the um, disappearance of the wealth middle class. So the fact that from in the 50s, 60s, 70s, uh, people could afford homes uh, on very um, ordinary salaries, uh, and that this created um, a new segment of the population which owned some wealth uh, in, in their home, whereas before everybody was renting, 80% um, of the population was renting. So this, this uh, process in the 50s, 70s, 60s, where some people have managed to accumulate some wealth, we're now seeing this being rolled back uh, and, and younger uh, cohorts um, relying much more on the private rented sector. So how has this affected gentrification? Um, I've taken um, the, the view, um, the macro view, by focusing on, on census data. So I have a couple of slides on methodology so that you have an idea of what I'm talking about, uh, that it's quite a restricted definition of gentrification that doesn't have a lot of these components, but I think it, it has the bare bones of it uh, and can provide some, some view of the overall trends. So I'm using uh, output areas. So these are the smallest um, census uh, geographies that you have in, in the UK. So there is 161,000 of those uh, with about 300 residents each. And for each of these small cells, I'm looking at the evolution between 2001 and 2011 um, in social economic category uh, and in tenure to see which changes have occurred in social economic in social economic dimension and which changes have occurred in the uh, tenure dimension and to see how these two are, are related. Um, I've only selected very stringent criteria to decide that an output area has experienced some, some change. So it may limit the number of output areas I'm looking at in the end, but I'm sure that these ones have these, these really strong uh, patterns of change. So just very quickly, uh, this slide, yeah. Uh, just very quickly to show you that I'm using this uh, NSEC data, which is the social, social economic categories of the census. And so I say that upscaling, social upscaling has happened. Uh, if the, the two first groups have seen their, uh, their numbers um, increase by quite a, a strong um, percentage, and uh, the lower three, so five, six, seven, um, have seen downscaling. So as you can see, it's quite a stringent um, definition, doing what I can with, uh, with the census data available. And I've decided to focus on three particular tenure shifts that have occurred in places with social upscaling. Um, which I sort of package together as buy to let gentrification. This is the transfer of social rented dwellings to the private rental sector, um, which, because it pushes out social renters, has a, a direct displacement effect. Uh, then I look at places where there's been an increase in private renters, either because there's been subdivision or a small new build, um, and this also creates a direct displacement because there is a replacement of private renters uh, in this particular case. And then the one which is the most common uh, and the most readily associated with buy-to-let, it's a case where an owner decides to put their dwelling on the private rental sector to get rental income, or a, an owner who decides to sell to a buy-to-let investor who, who then puts it on the private rental sector. So this is what I call uh, owning to private rent. But this, this is happening in parallel to the traditional owner, ownership-led gentrification, where you have the other three types which basically parallel um, the tenure shifts. So this is what I'm going to be talking about today, is the fact that gentrification is linked to an, an, a multitude of tenure shifts um, that are quite specific and that the, the owning to owning, the last one, so the sweat equity upscaling, is, a, is just one part of the broader gentrification story. So just to give you some, some very um, headline results, so we, I found that actually this buy to let gentrification has been more prevalent uh, numerically in, in England between 2001 and 2011 than than ownership gentrification. And interestingly, it happens more often in urban, central, and disadvantaged uh, areas of, of the UK. So the, the point that I find very interesting in this is that it's not just that it's an extra type of gentrification. You can say, well, okay, um, things are bad, and this is just showing that it's even worse. But actually, um, the, the reason why this, this new type of gentrification is important is because it's spatially extending gentrification to areas where it wouldn't otherwise uh, have occurred. And the mechanism here is that renters, tenants, have much less of an investment in the area into which they move. It's easier to direct them to places where they wouldn't necessarily buy, but you know, it might be okay to rent for a couple of years. And so there's a whole process through which um, real estate agents and buy-to-let investors have been opening up new areas of the city to middle classes which would not have entered as owner-occupiers. Um, so the whole mechanism here is that this new form of gentrification, buy-to-let gentrification, uh, is spatially extending the reach of uh, gentrification to new areas uh, in London. 
So just to give you uh, a picture for England as a whole, where you see white dots, it's uh, buy to let gentrification, where you see black dots, it's ownership gentrification, just to show you that it's happening in very urban and in these urban areas at the very center. And just to show you that it's happening across the country, it's not only a London phenomenon. Uh, this, this type of gentrification is happening everywhere. So this is more uh, London Zoom. Uh, this is the blue and the green, it doesn't really matter. It's whether I'm focusing on large scale or small scale um, ownership gentrification, but this is the spatial distribution of ownership uh, gentrification. And if I just uh, switch to the next slide, this is uh, buy to let gentrification. So you can see that in a place like London, when we talk about gentrification, we should actually be talking mostly about tenure shifts to the private rental sector. This is where social upscaling has been happening, and this is really where, um, where uh, gentrification is, is occurring in, in London. So income, uh, income uh, Alan enters the picture at this point, and uh, I show him these maps, and he says, well, What's really, really intriguing is that this seems to be not only an inner London phenomenon, but you can see the outer London ring has a lot of vital gentrification. And so this is where our collaboration started. And we tried to understand, well, why is it happening in places which are not especially attractive to, to middle class tenants? They would, of course, prefer to be in the center, next to centers of employment. And so we embarked on a, a detailed analysis of, of this. And our idea was that um, this by the is gentrification is happening in the suburbs because the inner city is so saturated and middle class tenants who can't afford to buy um, or even to rent in inner London are spilling over outside uh, to the rest of outer London and to the, to the greater southeast. As you can see, this is happening not just in, in London per se, but all around. And this is the reason is we, we think this is, this is happening is because outer London, as uh, Alan really opened my eyes to, is the fact that it's extremely variegated. Uh, it's not a, the, the sort of typical semis that we have in mind, but there's lots of variation. And in the areas where you have distinctive architecture, so um, buildings built before the 20th century, and excellent uh, transport accessibility, you actually have uh, a lot of this buy to let gentrification, or at least these are areas in which buy to let gentrification has been most successful. So what we did here, and it's really messy and you probably can't see anything, but we sort of looked at the, the relative um, occurrence of tenure shifts to the private rental sector accompanied by social upscaling, so what we call buy to let gentrification, and transfers to the private rental sector linked to social downscaling. So this is where uh, the tenants, uh, the, the, the buy to let investors who put their, their uh, dwelling on the private rental sector actually um, create through this process uh, downscaling. So poorer populations move in than, than used to live in these areas. And by the, gauging the relative importance of these two phenomena, we can see where middle class tenants have been uh, most readily attracted. And these are the areas um, with um, hashes in white, so where you have the combination of good accessibility but also some kind of distinctive architecture, which in our mind um, attracted these middle class tenants because it gave them the feeling of being in a metropolitan environment, it, it was a big city environment and not the sort of typical suburban uh, environment you would, you would think about initially. So very recently now with um, Alan and, and Pauline we've been trying to add another layer to the study and to focus at the relationship between ethnic change in London and vital gentrification, trying to see how these, how these things intersect. And this, this all started because Looking at census data between 2001 and 2011, you see massive amounts of, of, of sort of change uh, at the very local level uh, in, in sort of ethnic um, in the ethnic dimension. And so it was really a question of are are, are there relations that can be drawn between the, these two uh, these two big changes? And the idea was again to see whether bisexual gentrification has enabled the spread of, of gentrification processes to areas where they wouldn't have occurred beforehand. And we, we, we started out with two, two hypotheses. Um, is that the shift to renting means that there are areas where middle class white British uh, would not want to purchase, but through this entering as tenants would be happy to rent in. But then there's a second, there's a second dimension to this, that there may be some areas where white British uh, middle class tenants may not even want to rent. Uh, and in this case, the, the gentrification dynamic is taken over by um, middle class of migrant origin, and here mostly those uh, born overseas. So it's sort of a gradation. And we found that there were actually three distinct types of gentrification happening within, um, within the ethnic dimension. I don't know if you can see the numbers here, 
Uh, and this is quite a complex table. I'll try to break it down. But the rows are um, biophilic gentrification and ownership gentrification to distinguish these two types. And then the two um, uh, columns at the end are two types of wards. Wards in which the, the, um, the, middle, the working class uh, in 2001, so before these areas gentrified, um, were, were, had a significant number of uh, people who were not white British. So here, we're really taking a crude distinction between white British and those who are of other ethnicities. So the, the first column is wards in which there is a significant um, uh, percentage of working class ethnic minorities. The one on the very right is where basically the, the working class was m near exclusively white British. So it's basically to see if gentrification took different forms in places where the working class was either white British or was a working class uh, that was mostly made of, of ethnicities that are not white British. And the three types really come out strongly here. So I'll maybe show on this screen here. Uh, but the, the, really the, the first type of gentrification is this one here, um, where you have white British owners of working class origin who sell uh, to middle class um, white British populations. So this is really where you find most of these movements within the, the white British population. So this is the classic sweat equity gentrification. Owners uh, replace owners. But what is very interesting here is that this is happening mostly in, um, in wards that are dominated by the white, uh, white British working class. So in, in these wards, white British owners are very willing to buy and to gentrify. So where you have white British middle class, the uh, white British working class, the white British middle classes are really happy to gentrify uh, through, through ownership. In places, um, but in the, the, in the parallel way, uh, in places, again, where the working class is mostly um, white British, you also have areas where, these, um, where the white British enter as tenants. So this is the, the orange thing here. So within areas which are, which, in which the working class is white British, you, you really have these two phenomena, uh, either white British entering uh, as owners or as renters. But if we move to the wards in which there's a significant percentage of ethnic minorities, of middle classes, you basically do not find the white British entering at all, either as owners or as renters. And in these areas, uh, gentrification is mostly driven by um, minorities themselves. And there are two, two ways in which this happens. Either the minorities replace the white British or minorities replace minorities. So it's this, this was really staggering for us, is that you really could see that the gentrifiers were very different if you're talking about white British working class areas and areas which were working class but in which there is a significant number of ethnic minorities. So in this sense, gentrification is respecting ethnic lines. It's maybe blurring class lines because there's gentrification, so it's becoming uh, upscaled with displacement, of course. But in, in terms of ethnic <coughs> lines, you still you have these two types of areas which are sort of socially reproducing themselves through uh, gentrification. What are the numbers? The numbers are um, all output areas in which these particular combinations of things are happening. So these are among the 1,072 uh, particular gentrification areas uh, in which the war type is uh, white British. You have 600 of them which are um, movements within the white population. So it's just to show you which ones are the, the biggest contributors in, in each case. Yeah, so this, this is where we are at the moment. This paper is under review. We're just fighting with some reviewers at the moment. Hopefully, it will be out soon. Um, but what I wanted to just conclude is really with the, the major point that we've been finding is that it's not just that vital gentrification is another type of gentrification, but that it's really having this spatial impact, that it's really extending gentrification to new places uh, in London, but also in surrounding areas. And some of the mechanisms through which this happens, I think, is the lower neighborhood expectations of tenants versus owners. So I've already come on this. It's very easy for a real estate agent to direct some tenants to an area they wouldn't have originally considered because it's cheap, has a good uh, tube connection, it has some nice architecture. And so these people say, yeah, why not? Uh, let's rent there for, for a year or two. Uh, it doesn't really uh, fix us there for life. So I think this mechanism, it's hard to show through census data. And maybe one way to continue this, this project is to try to see if, if this really uh, holds weight or not. The second is the one uh, we hypothesized, that there's this need for metropolitan habitus, even though you can't afford inner, uh, inner London. And so it's this, this, uh, this, this uh, drive to maintain your status as a Londoner, even though you may not be able to afford it, which, which pushes people into particular areas, um, which, um, which could be gentrified. 
And then the third one is this, this relationship between uh, gentrification, ethnicity, and migration, is that it seems as though there are preferences, and I'm saying preferences not to say something else, and that means that different gentrifiers are gentrifying different types of places, and this is contributing and socially reprodu reproducing sort of ethnic divisions uh, in the city. So this sort of hypothesis I want to leave you with, and which uh, I think is an open question, uh, is that Baltelet may be the spatial expression of this disappearance of the wealth middle class that I was, I was talking about at the very beginning. Um, younger cohorts, uh, and by young, I'm not only referring to, to the very young. I think we're seeing more and more that people up into their 50s are still uh, not able to, to buy a property they would have bought a generation ago. So you have this, this whole section of society which has been raised on an expectation that they will be homeowners, uh, but are not able to maintain that, that position uh, socially and spatially. Uh, and so they are willing to, to go to places that they would not have gone before, thereby facilitating accumulation uh, of land and property wealth uh, that happens at the expense of the wealth poor. And I mentioned land here because it's something which doesn't really get treated in gentrification literature. But we know that if a house price increases, it's mostly because the value of the land itself increases. And the whole idea of the, of the rent gap is, is to really theorize these things. And I think one thing that never gets discussed in the UK and other places is, is that there are these landowners who, on top of the buy-to-let investors, are maybe the real winners of, of, these, uh, of these changing uh, social processes. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Again, I guess two very different um, approaches to the question of gentrification. One with a very developer-led, local authority-led, and as I say, very sort of, in a sense, public and iconic form of gentrification. And then this other process is which much more about individual, not always individual, but sometimes about individual investors using uh, buying collective means to gentrification. So sort of a much more uh, subtle, perhaps hidden form of gentrification, and one that is. Um, we'd argue in the paper much more spatially spread uh, opens up the question of uh, suburban gentrification as well. So, uh, if I'd like to open up to the floor questions to either of the presenters, or if you'd like to, you're also welcome to make a point, and other people in the floor are, are on the floor are very are welcome to, uh, to answer that point. Sorry, I'm, I'm, it's probably not a point of what you're on about, but it's one thing I'm really interested in is whether your research tells you anything about where people have been displaced to and the effects there as well. Yeah, unfortunately that's the, the big problem with gentrification research based on census data is that we observe population movement and uh, but we, we don't know where these people are moving to and where they come from and so we're just observing snapshots of changes in a particular place but we have no idea of, of the broader picture, the circularity of it. But what you can clearly see from census data is basically populations shifting out. So uh, part of some work I did uh, in preparation for the last paper was to look at what happened to particular ethnic groups between 2001 and 2011, uh, and how they're spatially distributed across, across London. Uh, and for some groups, you can clearly notice a shift upwards. So in 10 years, you have a population which shifts uh, a mile or two southwards or northwards uh, away from inner London. So you, some ethnic groups really, really see this displacement. Displacement uh, is one way to explain it. You can say it's also suburbanization, but there is this movement away from, from the center in some ethnic groups. Others um, ma manage to maintain local concentrations. So this, this shows that there are different experiences by different groups. But uh, it's not possible to link it to a particular gentrification in a particular area. So these are just wider. What I'm showing you here is only 
the tip of the iceberg. It's, it's only where tenure shifts in the private sector have been accompanied by social upscaling. Uh, and the caveat is that both of this is measured in a very strict way. So I'm only really looking at the very top layer of what's going on. But there's then the whole gray zone where you have shifts to the private rented sector with downscaling or with no particular social change, no particular revenue <coughs> change. So of course there's the, the complexity of what's going on in London and in England is, is, is massive. And I'm only showing you this very specific segment of that, which is upscaling uh, defined in a very narrow way. But I think what I wanted to do is show you the, the really the ideal type, the, the very minute number of areas where something extremely significant is happening, uh, to be able to come up with some hypotheses about its spatial distribution and some of the mechanisms, uh, all the well knowing that I'm only looking at a very, a very fine part of, uh, of the picture. But I think my what I'm trying to move into is, is to think more generally about what this shift to the private rental sector means at a societal level uh, and what it means to have some individuals and, and developers and, um, and uh, corporations uh, <coughs> accumulating housing at the expense of people who are not able to, to afford housing in their own. So I think there, there is something momentous going on here. And uh, I mean, in, in wealth research, uh, it's, it's clearly highlighted that something is going on, that there's this really massive shift away from the sort of homeowner societies that, that were the, the, the sort of the ideal in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So I think that's, recently that's also something I've been trying to work to explore this, this connection. And gentrification seems to be, especially this type of gentrification, seems to be really exacerbating these, these trends. Yeah, I, I find particularly because um, one of our um, arguments, and we happen to be working with um, Susie and Julia from LSE on, on this, because I need some, sort of data, I don't work with big data, do you will with the granular. Um, and, and, and what I find interesting from this is whether you can make those, because one of our arguments is that, that, that um, migrant and ethnic groups are disproportionately impacted by this sort of developer-led and, and sort of supported by local government. But it would be interesting if you could make that correlation with policies, you know, whether that movement that you're saying that you saw in the big data, whether there are significant policy changes as well in urban planning, for example, that could lead to that movement um, and it cut across to some of the arguments that, that a lot of the campaigners, you know, and, and people like me are putting across, but we do that in a very granular way, like, you know, we work in solid notes with 35%, um, we pair with other academics um, who have other, but I think that would be an interesting <laughs> yeah, to draw some light on that, absolutely. because you manage those sort of sets of data. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, um, I'm quite interested. Yeah. I, I don't know if you can say from what we found that, that the minorities are especially targeted, because mm -hmm. what we find actually is that in most parts of the country, it's mostly the white, mm -hmm. you know, white British working class mm -hmm. that are affected. I mean, the whole mm -hmm. right side of my table was gentrification really affecting uh, mm -hmm. the white British working class. But I think it's just a reflection of in most of the country, the working class is white. Uh, mm -hmm. In London, uh, there happens to be many working class people um, of, of, of minor ethnic origin. So, so I think it's, that's the reason why London is, is seeing a lot of this. But this happening, as we were discussing also today, in, in other big cities in, in, in the UK, you have the same sort of thing happening, like centers like Birmingham, uh, Leeds, etc. So I think it's not only a London thing, but I think the idea, the idea we have is that these places um, have the biggest rent gaps because they have never been gentrified until now. Mm -hmm. So these remain central city locations where you have populations which have not yet been troubled by gentrification. So why the rent gaps have been, have been increasing for years because the places around them have been gentrified. And for some reason, there's been this resistance from uh, white British owner occupiers in previous years of gentrification to enter these areas. But now that the possibility exists for tenure shifts and for sending in new waves uh, of gentrifiers with less concern about, about the, the place and less maybe an idea of stigma, etc. that this is actually facilitating the gentrification of these areas. And what I mentioned is that a lot of these people entering these, these ethnic minority areas are actually born overseas. Mm -hmm. So these are highly educated migrants who, who are looking for a place to stay and they don't know London, they say, well, I want to live in the center, and then they see a real estate ad and they go live in the center. They have no idea about what impact they're having on So it's a bit. Yeah. 
find that interesting because most of the public or particularly the state is around the new buildings. We need more houses, we need more affordable homes. But there's this huge change change that's actually taking place within the existing stock, which I think is one of the particularly interesting points about your presentation. Yeah. I mean uh, there's the problem with looking at big new builds is that the output areas are basically they are split because you have 3,000 people uh, that now appear in a cell that used to have 300, so they have to create lots of new cells, and it's very difficult to compare the other ones that are there. So we did a bit of that, and those were the, the other colored dots on the map. So we could compare this ordinary gentrification within the housing stock and this new build, so the massive projects like in, in the Olympic side and in all those places. Uh, there, the problem in, with gentrification literature is it's very difficult to argue that this is gentrification because you don't have really um, re residents who were living there, so there's no direct displacement. It does create a huge impact on the local area, so people have uh, said it creates displacement pressure on, on surrounding areas. And we have found that a lot of these new builds have been essentially designed for the higher and middle classes. Uh, and this is joining a lot of these discussions at the local level that they're interested in no social housing included. So what we've labeled as new build gentrification is these new developments where you basically just have middle classes and higher classes moving. And there's been a lot of these. And in these cases, you can really say, well, yes, this does cause displacement pressure because you have new residents who come in and all these new residents have uh, have tastes that are very different from existing residents in, in, in surrounding areas. So there has also been that. <laughs> it's not just to say that it's only in the existing housing stock, but there's been massive changes also to the build to rent and all these things happening. Your data is going into 2011, is that right? I mean, since then, there have been quite significant tax changes. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know, do you have any information about what effect this has had? Because you're talking about right to left, which has been heavily affected by these tax changes. Um, yeah, do you have any information or ideas about what's happened there? I mean, the, the idea, I don't have much information because we don't, we don't know much. We know that the private rental sector as a sector has started to stabilize at around 40% uh, households in England. So it gets shot up very quickly between 2001 and 2015, and now it's sort of stabilized. Um, but what I do know is that property remains one of the most high-yielding high investments that you can find everywhere. Maybe land is the only one. Residential land is maybe the one that's even better. But property everywhere is, is, is seeing a huge wall of money crash into it, looking for investment opportunities. So even though there may be more tax restrictions, I think it might be affecting smaller individual private tax investors more than the big corporate ones. So what you could see is a professionalization of this, so you have a much bigger corporate landlords coming in and, uh, and buying up property and, and putting it on the rental market, as we were discussing also, is, is, is part of the, what's happening in the US after the foreclosures. Does that make it more like a, a continental city, like a German city, where you have big um, landlord companies with a massive rented sector? Except that in, in places like Germany, a lot of this is still in socialist, or at least in housing associations, which, which are uh, normally not allowed to make profits. So the difference here is that if you have corporate landlords who are of the same size as the German ones, then this has this, this really raises the risk of a monopoly or a oligopoly situation in which rents can be raised sort of a cartel manner, so that, that would be difficult. <laughs> the individual landlords, at least they're, it's very chaotic how they take decisions. As you can see, there was actually a lot of downscaling. So a lot of private rental investors probably made really bad decisions about where to buy, or too many people bought in the same places, which really affected the supply and put prices down. So this has, this may in a way, the fact that it's individual investors uncoordinated making their own judgments following these, uh, these real estate booms, uh, uh, they, they probably, creates an oversupply of private rental housing. It might be better that it's in the individual private rental hands rather than, than the big corporate landlords, which have better reading of the market and might put these pressures uh, even higher. I mean, I work in the sort of institutional uh, property um, industry, I think. There's certainly a uh, prof professionalization happening when it comes to the uh, private rental sector. I, I think. Personally, I see that as largely a good thing. Um, I mean, one of the things, I mean, one of the things that is troublesome in the UK in terms of having this large rented sector is that it is so unprofessional, and that there are, the landlords are literally, you know, they don't pick up the phone if your boiler is broken. Um, so, 
we, you know, you could argue that given that um, our cities are now so much more popular uh, than they were in the 80s, and that is an inevitable change. Um, and therefore, yes, we are living in a situation where some people might not be able to buy in the center of cities, but people still like to live in the center of cities. Having landlords that are professional and are there to provide stockers of a certain quality and of a certain service um, is actually a very beneficial thing. And I don't think that those will be affected by tax changes at all. It's, an, it's, it's you know, your mums and dads that uh, indeed just try to channel their savings into, into uh, small scale uh, rented properties that um, really give um, the rented sector in the UK such a bad name. Um, so I think going back to gentrification, um, you know, we talk a lot about negative impacts of gentrification here, but I think we shouldn't forego on the fact that in many ways gentrification has thrown a lifeline to some of our urban areas that have been forgotten for decades and hadn't seen any investment, including Seven Sisters District or, or Elephant and Castle. And in some ways, it was the fact that that investment was so long overdue that yes, gave great opportunity to some of our migrant communities to live there, to put businesses there. But there is also a case to be made that we ought to do something really um, active and, and uh, you know, really put those spaces to the best use possible. And that might not be those things any longer. Yeah, but without throwing out those communities, and I, as I said, we do not oppose development. But we oppose that development that disposed of us. And the Elephant and Castle and the Seven Sisters, there's a clear, a clear, a clear determination by the councils and by the developers to not have those communities there. Yeah, you've made a point very, very. And we have evidence for it as well. And I, I, I don't. I don't. Now, so we're not saying that, we, yes, investment <coughs> in these areas is needed. Yes, everyone wants a better place to live. But do not throw us out. Do not dispense of mm -hmm. us. And I think that's that's the issue that we try and, and the argument that. So I don't disagree with you. What I disagree is with the fact that in the practice, what this means is throwing away these communities, displacing them, putting them aside, not considering them, making every single step for them to stay impossible. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's that's. Sorry. <laughs> I was very intrigued by the subject because my own PhD in this place, 50 years of home, was effectively dealing with the issue of regeneration of docklands in, in Southwark. And um, I surveyed people in Rotherhide, and most of the people wanted to move out because they couldn't see any future. Um, and when asked whether they wanted to move to their neighbours, they said no. And most of them, I think, moved halfway to Kent or. <laughs> Anyway, and, and those uh, that stayed actually benefited more and, because uh, they saw their house prices. Well, well they, 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 the people who were there were council tenants. Um, and um, so I think it's quite interesting that there may be a difference between areas that are in need of regeneration because they're derelict and not seen as accessible um, and where the people don't see any prospect of getting employment. And areas like Kellerton Castle, which perhaps is seen as in the way up. And it, it seems to me, therefore, one, one should be trying to um, make a distinction not just between types of people, but between types of place. Uh, that would be uh, one point. I, I also do wonder about sort of cities over, over time. Um, again, thinking about you know, the changes that took place in Hackney and Islington over a 50, 60 year period. Um, I would argue that uh, buildings that might otherwise have been fallen down or been pulled down as being seen as slums have been uh, re brought back to life in ways that perhaps uh, people in London as a whole appreciate. Um, so I, I look, is there a case for trying to uh, talk not just about people going up and down, but places going up and down? Leave that. Oh, so I should probably introduce myself. My name is London Locke. 
uh, born and raised in South East London, uh, former estate agent uh, turned electoral candidate. I'm now a political officer for the United Union Housing Market Branch. Uh, I've got a couple of queries for each of you. Uh, over the last five to ten years, we've seen the rise of a number of financial instruments designed to help uh, individuals on lower incomes, particularly families or people looking to grow their families. Uh, things like help to buy, shared ownership, staircase, etc. Um, much of your, your research obviously focused on uh, buy to let. I was wondering if you offer some thoughts on how these newer instruments uh, have affected gentrification. Um, so my question for Antoine. Um, for Patria, uh, my question is, uh, given that the, uh, I've had my own dealings with a number of councils in, in South London, I'm particularly involved in Cressingham Gardens in Lambeth, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, how do you find working with these councils and facing political battles, particularly given that these are Labour councils? I think uh, Southwark's Labour, Lewisham is Labour, Lambeth is also Labour. If you were to look at their material, they would, they would make the argument that we are benefiting the council, we are benefiting the community, this is all for them, we're building 1,600 new affordable houses. How do you find that, that paradigm, you know, trying to make a left-wing case for uh, migrant rights to a, you know, ostensibly left-wing party? How do, you, how do you find that? And there's a gentleman over there asking about where the poor people go. Anecdotally speaking, when I was an estate agent, people move further out, also um, they move into shit housing, essentially, uh, further away from stations, into more sort of less desirable areas, further away from the high streets, you'll find there's often sort of stations dotted around, and there's, it's sort of when you go off the beaten road away from the high street that you'll mm -hmm. find um, poorer residents and individuals that haven't benefited from gentrification. Just then a very specific question, so I thought maybe we'd address that and then come up to yeah, um, here I think I'm going to sort of answer this question with my Latin elephant hat rather than my um, academic <laughs> one. Um, and um, in terms of how we started, you know, we being um, uh, uh, Latin elephant has received money from Southern Council, and one of those was to do um, what was a sort of, um, yeah, like, like ask the traders, what is their vision for the area? And that's how this idea of the Latin Quarter came. So it was about asking their vision for the area and what they wanted. Um, what I, the, when I talked about the public relations veneer, you know, was we received 22,000 pounds one year and another year perhaps 15,000 pounds. You know, another social enterprise come in, does very little to, to sort of aid the process and received, you know, something like uh, 20,000 per, per, per head, right? Or, or per trader. Um, and so that tells you, you know, wh where the interests are. Politically, Latin American as a charity doesn't deal with politics and it's not about to go into that. But what's happening in London and in Seven Sisters is both are labor, labor um, led, and it, it does happen a lot. Um, I think 35%, which is the other campaign group, have documented how many of these councillors later will go on and work for the developers. I find it that they are like in the middle. You know, for one, they need the votes. And so when they live like American votes, they come to us. I don't promote politicians because that's not part of what I do. So I don't go towards that. And it's a really contentious sort of going backwards and forwards relationship. They. Um, we started, they listened to us, we started really strongly, really evidence-based um, sort of research, and they liked it. But when we saw that the application was submitted and that all of that consultation, all of that going backwards and forwards with the council and meeting with them and making sure that what we were asking for was in that application, and nothing, not even the 10% that is policy compliant, was in there, then we went outspoken and opposed the application. And that's when things began to change a bit with the local authority and, um, and our position with the local authority. So it's very much like a veneer and it's coming, it's like they don't close doors but they don't open it, they don't answer, they do. Every time we now, I don't know if you notice that Twitters are much more direct and it's 
um, <laughs> to the point here they are very flat because they're closing doors, they're not answering to email. So what's our conversation with them was like that. Um, we were quite, um, well, our conversations were going and we were trying to negotiate things and we, we you know, the, the reason why we gain all these things is because we fought for every little one of those and we presented the evidence. But now it's like they're not even listening in a way. So we're on Twitter constantly, you know, now at the moment, you know, I'm, I'm in academia, so I'm, you know, we're employing two people and they're the ones really doing that and loads of volunteers who are also helping us with, with loads of expertise and data. But it's really flawed and I feel that they're making the bed for developers in, in, in a lot. This is not just in Southwark, this is happening um, a lot. When you look at the planning, you know, documents and their visions, it doesn't, um, it doesn't differ from what the proposal for the areas are. And you're thinking, wait a minute, can we get something there for, for the migrant ethnic businesses in the policy, which is always mine. And they might put something in there, but they don't necessarily have a commitment to it. Maybe take the question to notice. So, on the question of the professionalization of private rental sector investors, whether that will produce a better private rental sector, I don't know. But I don't think these actors would be any less, any less uh, have, have, have much more hesitation to increase rents than, than individual landlords. I think their reading of the market will make it easier for them to know where rents are can be pushed up uh, without without a problem. So I I'm, I'm don't think professionalization would be good for tenants in, in general. Uh, the question of the, the most efficient use of space, I think the problem with this kind of discourse is that efficiency is always seen as, as a byword for both profit and short-term profit. So how can as much value be extracted from a particular place at a particular time? I think the short-term, this short-term sort of profit outlook is is not going to lead to long-term, to long-term beneficial outcomes. I think um, cities don't cannot be homogenized and just driven by short-term profit logic. I don't think those are attractive cities in, in the long run. So I would say um, it's more important to think about how cities will be in 50 years and what kind of city we want in those 50 years than to extract as much value as you can today on, on a six-month basis. I don't think those that makes a livable city in, in the medium term. Um, in terms of starting out from different types of places, uh, it's an interesting idea. I have to think about it more. What, what I find in the research here, which is very macro and, of course, very broad, is that it, it doesn't really what type of place you are. Um, you tend to find similar processes happen. And what I mean by that is that you could have, in some places, more winners than losers, but you will always have losers. Uh, in any kind of gentrification or social upscaling, you will necessarily have people who will not fit anymore, who will move even if they don't really have to just because an area has changed too much for them. So the, the thing is that, yes, it's true, some places might benefit more from gentrification, but not everyone will benefit equally, even in those places. So I think it's always important to keep this social justice. And gentrification is, is essentially a way to, to keep that, 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 that perspective alive in our heads when we think about uh, yeah, just about the instruments, just to finish. I, I can't tell you much about that. I'm not a housing policy person, really. I mean, all I know is that a lot of flats that were uh, sold through or bought through by Dubai have ended up on the private rental market. So tenants have bought their flats and then uh, have started to fight with investors or corporate investors. And so basically you have a flat which used to be uh, socially publicly owned, which now becomes privately owned. And, and, and this is basically a loss of public stock. So that's, that's a very big concern. Uh, shared ownership by, I can't say more about that. You'll have to find a housing policy person. Okay, I've got a two minute sign being flashed at me, and there were two people before who um, already had their hands up. So if we could just take points from them, and then I will, I will have to close in front of this. Two months ago, one, one, and one. Um, two questions. Sorry. <laughs> 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 one from the town centre. As far as I can see, you're right.
and what certainly this mayor and the, pre and the uh, pre previous mayor wanted was to look at the fringes of town centres like the open, like San Francisco, or look at nearby town centres where you could provide affordable business space for a time, but probably not for posterity. Now, would, would that fit with the concerns of the community that you've been working with? And secondly, what does gentrification mean in big question 50 years out for urban productivity? Can we leave that? Both of those as a point rather than a question because of the time, and we will go over to the George um, after that for tradition just because of time, but uh, it would be good to leave with the point. And I will also say, I live in a spring village, I don't want to say anything. Um, <laughs> my question is about heritage, both uh, something that kind of resonates both of you, I'm interested in how heritage is being modernised, gentrification, and, you know, in, in, in all different aspects by developers and councils, but obviously in the case of um, Cities, especially if heritage was mobilized and got you know backing from UNESCO. So I'm interested to hear what your perspective is on how heritage is being mobilized. And it also obviously in terms of these new forms of gentrification in areas that people had been visited before, you know, finding a way to keep our heritage. And then also I just wonder what you're saying. Corporate watch has been working with different groups and getting really over to see online to kind of map out the entangled nature of all these council centers that have been trying to develop in that genre. But yeah, heritage is something. If we can leave heritage and official policy on my street as a sort of floating there, thank you all very much for um, joining us. Thank you to Antoine and to Pat Fear for their contemplations. And if you could fill in uh, one of these feedback cards, we'd greatly appreciate it.